Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another AP Environmental Science screencast with your AP Environmental Science teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to look at ecological niche, uh, niches and adaptations. Each species in an ecosystem has a specific role or way of life. This is known as a niche or niche, depending on who you want to be that day. Um, there are different types. There's fundamental and realized niches. The full potential range, basically the actual possibility for an organism that's going to be its fundamental niche uh, then there's its realized niche it's this is the the actual role it plays that it, to in order to avoid competition and survive so we look at really the realized niche is what the uh, organism actually does versus the fundamental basically kind of what it could do here we have generalist and specialist species, and we'll actually talk more about these uh, co coming up in a early, a next chapter also. But just looking at their niche, this diagram, I kind of like it. it. It brings in some very good points. So we have a specialist species right here. And what we can see, and it can be any specialist. It doesn't matter if it's this panda or not. And you can see that this area right here is known as its niche breadth. Both organisms have. Notice the generalist species has a much wider bell curve here, or much wider curve, much wider niche. It's able to utilize a little bit more of the environment than the specialist can, or the opportunities it has is a little bit wider. Um, the separation right here, the farther these two curves are away from each other, the less chance there is for competition. Where we have overlap in this region right here, this is gonna lead to competition in that region. So what organisms will, in a not so knowingly way, is they'll try to minimize that overlap right there to avoid competition. And it'll just allow those different species to exploit their environment in different ways. But in all in all, generalist species uh, tolerate a wide range of conditions. Uh, they're able to survive change a little bit better typically than our specialist species, which can only tolerate a narrow range of conditions. Um, what we see to, to avoid competition is known as resource partitioning, where organisms within the same environment will attack or tackle uh, different challenges or different feeding in different ways. And what we can see in this picture is that we have the flamingo feeding on one area deeper into, the, into this beach here. Um, then we have this turn of this black skimmer moving farther out where the flamingo can't. So by utilizing different parts of this beach all along the way, the oyster catcher moving down right here into the shallows. And even here, the piping plover moving farther up onto the beach, we can see that they're able to avoid each other. And by avoiding each other and specializing into different areas of the beach, they avoid competition and they're able to utilize their resource to the fullest potential versus if they all tried to get after the same food, then there would be a huge amount of competition. Uh, we also have evolutionary divergence. So an evolutionary divergence or adaptive radiation, sometimes called each species has the um, evolves in a little bit different of a way to uh, take advantage of certain types of food. And you can see here the uh, finches and we can see how their beaks are each a little bit different so they can utilize food in a different way. A speciation is basically a new species can arise when a member of a population becomes isolated for a long period of time. Um, basically, the, it could be the reproductive isolation or geographic isolation. Typically, we're looking at geographic isolation, which is isolating uh, members of a population. The genetic makeup changes, uh, preventing them from producing fertile offspring with the original population if reunited. So here in this example, we have this fox, the Arctic fox and the gray fox. And in here, here we go. Here's our Arctic fox, fox population. Okay, so the early fox came in. We had some moving northward, some moving southward in here two different environmental conditions in the area. They're kind of separated now. So it's kind of like a geographic isolation. Their gene pool here in the Arctic Fox is gonna to start to begin to be noticeably different than what we hear in the Southern population. Eventually the gene pool is so different that if these two were to mate, they would produce infertile offspring. 
So at this, uh, basically at this point, they become two separate species. And it's basically because they've remained isolated from each other for a period of time. So geographic isolation leads to reproductive isolation and eventually to speciation or a new species forming. So geographic isolation to reproductive isolation leading to a new species forming or potentially a new species forming. Extinction uh, occurs when a population just cannot adapt to any changing environmental conditions. Uh, we're seeing this a lot now with uh, toads, frogs, uh, these indicator species extremely sensitive to environmental changes. And what ends up happening over time is they just can't change quick enough. They just, it's not in them, it's not in their ability um, to meet the environmental changes that, uh, that's been put at them. Here is just looking at a number of mass, ex uh, mass extinctions going through time. So if we move right on back, so we have the Ordovician right over here, 50% of many animals on trilobites died. And then you can see it starts building back up the number of species and then another extinction. And we build back up another extinction and it builds and it keeps going. And now building back up and due to humans, what we're starting to see is that we're going to have something very similar to another mass extinction. But here, just outlining the major mass extinctions that uh, we've come to document. On this line right here, millions of years ago, moving back, kind of right over here, really when our life, uh, life for organisms really started. And you notice that we, you know, we kind of steadily been increasing a few dips and dives along the way, increasing, little dip again, another little mass extinction, and then finally moving up into here. And 1.8 million years ago, there's us, and here we go. We notice we have that trend downward. This is what scientists are worried about. Uh, we can correlate it. It's what you, you know, the effect that we're having on the environment. Is it possibly changing enough to cause another mass extinction? And looking at something like this, it would have a tendency to lead you to believe so. And a lot of people believe so. So what can we do? We have genetic engineering, uh, possibly the future of evolution. You know, this is uh, something that's uh, highly debated uh, through ethics and morals, uh, whether or not something we really should be doing or not opens the door to a lot of debate. But we've used artificial, uh, artificial selection to change genetic characteristics of populations uh, for, for quite a few years now. Uh, with similar genes through selective breeding. Uh, selective breeding is nothing new to humans. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time. Dogs, uh, and basically any domesticated animal, really, uh, has we've selectively bred to get whatever um, traits that we wanted useful to us. Um, and in plants, we've done it with also. We have also used genetic engineering to transfer genes from one species into another. And the way we do it uh, is with recombinant DNA technology, or sometimes what we have is genetically modified organisms, uh, which we'll be talking about when we start talking a little bit more into food. But here, what we're able to do is take the, a section of DNA from an organism we want, this, this gene of interest, uh, and we're able to insert it into a bacteria where it becomes incorporated into a plasmid, or we take it and insert it into a plasmid, where then it's put uh, bacteria well, culture, they'll make it, they'll really, they'll make copies of that plasmid. And then we're able to take that out from those and then kind of use like a, almost like a little pellet gun to put these plasmids on and then shoot them into the, the DNA of a plant that we want or organism we want. And then the plant's machinery will actually reproduce that, incorporating it into its DNA. And that's kind of how we have it. The, the, the basics are there for that. So where does that leave us? Uh, we're basically rebuilding organisms from the cell components into clone organisms. Been cloning, it's, uh, it's in the news. Issues with it, uh, we see higher miscarriage rates, aging, organ defects. It's not, it's not a perfect science, uh, but they're working on it. Genet but genetic engineering isn't all bad. It can improve human condition, and, but the results are not always predictable. We don't necessarily know what's going to happen. There's a uh, many different things that can happen. Uh, but Norman Borlaug, uh, agriculturists used it. 
uh, in his favor to save millions of lives um, feeding people. So, I mean, it's there. It can be good. It can be bad. But we're, uh, you know, pretty much a lot of people are uh, up in the air with it at the time. That's really about it. So, controversy, what's going to happen, long-term consequences. We'll have to wait and see and figure it out. Oh, I hope you enjoyed this screencast. And uh, that's it. Take care.